Welcome to Reverse Engineering News. I'm your host, Hash. Thanks for joining. This week, I've got three awesome items for you. First, we're going to look at an embarrassing attack against a major smartphone chip manufacturer that allows you to bypass the power-up password just completely, right past it. Next, we're going to look at hacking the original Xbox again using a method that was only ever talked about as theoretically possible. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about the tools and uh, software that's used to reverse engineer and design things. I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Richesum. When companies say there's no user serviceable parts inside, we kindly disagree. First, let's talk about this mobile phone password bypass. There's a company called Unisoc. I'd never heard of them before, but apparently they're the fourth largest chip manufacturer of smartphone processors. Now, they have over 5,000 employees, so it's a, it's a pretty big company. I think it's over 9% market share. And there's an attack that was published by a, a group called OneKey, and what they showed was a clock glitching attack. And so what that means is they're going to mess with the clock line. The clock line is like a sine wave. It's a pulse train that the processor runs off of. Everything's based on this clock being there. And so a clock glitch is usually messing with this clock in some kind of complex way, sending extra pulses in the same time that only one pulse was sent or something like that. This attack is nothing like that. This is the most rudimentary attack on a clock you've ever seen. They literally take a wire and they just ground the clock line. So they temporarily stop the clock from going to the processor. They do it while the phone is waiting for its password to be entered. And because of that, the phone just reboots and bypasses all of the password part of booting up. Uh, it must be it's some other kind of safe mode it enters into or, or something that just bypasses everything. You would think it would just normally reboot and put you right back at that password prompt, but that's not the case. In it, they say that you have to apply this attack precisely. This is what one key says. But when you watch the video, there's nothing really precise about this attack. I mean, this is literally an attack that we could do if we had a phone that's vulnerable and literally a piece of wire. I mean, you could probably do this attack with a paperclip. It's that level of crazy. Let's talk about hacking the Xbox again. So there was a book, I've talked about it before, that Bunny wrote called Hacking the Xbox. And in it, he, he talks about all the steps that he took to get access to this thing. And one of the first things was getting access to this secret boot ROM. Now, the boot ROM is sent across this like South Bridge connection from one part made by NVIDIA over to the Intel processor when it boots up. The way that Bunny was able to get this is he put a device, he basically built a device that sniffed this high-speed bus, and he was able to get that data. You got to remember, this is like 20 years ago or something, these attacks were done, and, and the complexity of these things, these high-speed buses, right now everybody can buy a, a device for probably a couple hundred bucks to read these high-speed buses. But that wasn't the case at the time. Everything was custom, FPGAs, all this stuff that had to be done to sniff this thing. Well, there was always this attack that was talked about that was talked about kind of theoretically, which is maybe you could hook up a JTAG adapter to the Intel processor. And so it was looked at a little bit, and there's even a spot where Bunny mentions it, there's a line you have to control. It's called a TRST line when you're controlling JTAG. And this line, they tied to ground. And when you look at the board, you can actually see what used to be a test point on the bottom of the board. And maybe it existed at some point in the life of the Xbox, but it was deleted. And so you see a big ground plane that's there, which is a fill of metal, and this little hole that's left in it. And so probably the board designers, not wanting to touch too much on this board that had been through all this testing, just deleted the connection and grounded it internally, but didn't bother to regenerate this ground fill so that they wouldn't, you know, mess with anything on a working design. Like if you've designed circuit boards, you know, you don't want to touch the damn thing once it works. I mean, you might break something else. And so you have to go through all the validation again. Now, what Marcus at RET2 Systems did 
is he built what's called an interposer board, which when you read this blog post is crazy. He basically built a board where you desolder, you heat up and remove the Intel processor from the board, and you make a little circuit board that kind of acts as like a connection in between. So you solder this back down where the processor was, and then you put the Intel chip back on top of that, and off the side of the little board is now all your connection points that you want to tap into. And this line that was grounded, you're now in control of it, along with direct access to all of the other JTAG lines. I mean, just doing that in itself, designing that board, getting it all to work, desoldering the chip, putting it back, and having it all boot up is, is a pretty crazy feat. It's an awesome way to attack it. Now, you have to hook up a special JTAG uh, adapter to this Intel processor. It's not just your average JTAG adapter that probably we all have sitting in a drawer somewhere. Uh, this is a special one that uh, can speak the language to this Intel chip. Everything that was done was different. It was under NDAs, the companies that could build debuggers and adapters for these Intel chips. It wasn't just every everybody got this uh, spec published to them. And at the time, like when Bunny was hacking these things, when it was originally out, these JTAG uh, programmers, uh, you know, that could connect and allow debugging and all these things, uh, they were anywhere from like nine to $40,000 is what Marcus found when he did the, the research on it. So at the time, this attack wasn't really feasible, like unless we got an extra 40000 sitting in our bank account to hack the Xbox, which maybe at the time people that were going to sell mod chips actually did. Like it's not unheard of for someone to spend that kind of money. But also these companies weren't just selling it to any joker that wanted to buy it. Like they were very protective over this technology. The crazy thing is now though, 20 years later, this nine to $40,000 device is like under $100 on eBay. That's what Marcus was able to get his for. Um, so even though 20 years ago, attacking using this device was probably unfeasible or, or not something that average people could do, now anybody could buy this thing if you can find it, if it shows up on eBay. Now, when he first hooked it up, it didn't quite work just you know plugging it in. There's actually a little pick chip that's on the Xbox board, and that chip is doing like a verification process to make sure everything's fine. So it's doing a challenge and it's expecting a certain response. And if it doesn't get it, it just resets everything else on the board. So it, it did that challenge and it didn't pass because the, the processor wasn't hooked up. He's got this debugger hooked up to it and he's trying to talk to it. So what he did was he used an Arduino Uno to connect in on this little bus that it's expecting to hear this message from, the pick chip. And he sent and, and basically did the challenge in response so that the pick chip wouldn't reboot everything. And then the JTAG adapter was able to connect to the processor. And once it did, he was able to see the secret uh, boot ROM, the 512 bytes uh, that everybody was trying to find back in the day. Now, I mean, it's awesome as just an attack to see if it could be done. And and I love attacks like this. You know, it's, they already have the secret boot ROM. That's probably, it's probably not that secret. We can probably go find it on some website right now. But really it was, could this attack be done? You know, is it possible? And after 20 years, now we know. You know, you can go read the blog post and see. It's a great write-up. Um, it's very detailed, and it's a, it's a hell of an attack. What I took away from it is, the longer that you're going to allow a device to live in the wild and, and be in a, a place of maybe securing things, you know, whether these are infrastructure-type devices or something else, the cost of attack is going down, 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 down over time. So while right now we might design something and we say, well, the equipment to attack this is $100,000 or $500,000 or you need a scanning electron microscope or something else, you know, 20 years from now, that attack isn't going to cost the same amount. You know, this attack went from 40000 perhaps to a hundred, um, say 10000 to be conservative. So two orders of magnitude cheaper than it was originally. So you got to keep that in mind. When you design things, they become very easy to attack over time. Finally, reverse engineering tools uh, and, and tools that are used to design things. So I've been looking at different tools recently, and I've looked at tools for a long time, and I'm sure you do too. And reverse engineering is kind of one of these things where you do a lot of different things. There's a lot of different disciplines. Like 
there's machining and there's 3D printing and there's circuit board design and then there's reverse engineering of software and and so there's all these different tools you need. And the, the challenge I find is that a lot of the tools now, they're all subscription based. They all have some monthly fee. And some of them are free for hobbyists. But the reality is you can't rely on a free cloud piece of software. You know, at any time, the company can just decide that it's not free anymore, um, you know, or, or that your access isn't free. You know, it's maybe maybe my use is commercial. Maybe it's not. It's questionable. If I were to use something as part of this channel, uh, you know, what what license it would fall under. It's questionable for any of us. So I've been looking at, you know, free tools like open source tools to use. Um, and so, you know, I'll probably mention more of them on this show and and make other videos about them separately. But things like FreeCAD and KeyCAD and, uh, you know, Cutter and Ryzen and Ghidra, all these tools that we know if we create something with them and save it on some virtual machine somewhere, we can open it up a year from now or two years from now and we still have access to it. And it'll still work with the version of software that was sitting there. And, and we don't get uh, kind of the rug pulled out from underneath us at any given time. Now, that's not to mention that, you know, sensitive work that's done as well. Yeah, I don't know if I want that stuff sitting in someone's cloud environment. Um, relying on them to secure it and hoping that they do a good job. It's just, uh, you know, maybe it's a personal preference thing. I'm curious if you have tools that you use, you know, free tools, open source tools that anyone can access that you like, you know, what are they? Leave a message down in the comments. Uh, let us know if there's some great tools you've been using that the rest of us should know about. And if you have some paid tools that you feel aren't that much per month, and you can, you know, understanding you stack them all together, uh, let us know what those are too. You know, I'm, I'm not opposed to paying for any tools, but the, the challenge is they're not used very frequently. And so paying every single month for something I use once every few months, it doesn't, doesn't seem worthwhile to, to do it in the long run. Now you can find me in a few different places. You can find me on X, which used to be Twitter. I actually had my most... Uh, liked whatever retweeted, reposted post ever I've ever done. This uh, oscilloscope watch right here. You check it out. People seem to love that thing and they love the engineer's mini notebook. You can also find us on Discord. I'm over there, a bunch of people chatting about reverse engineering. You can share stuff you're working on, ask questions, uh, you know, uh, just chat with other like-minded people. If you do take pictures of things, a lot of times devices were taken apart we might be the first ones to take it apart or the first ones to have decent pictures. Create an account on the wiki and share those pictures with everybody. Uh, I just saw someone the other day mention they didn't have good pictures on the FCC website when they went searching for a device. Share what you're working on so the rest of us can see it. Thanks a lot for watching. We'll see you next week.